Well, let's get started, and thank you for your patience. Um, I know it's uh, a hard place to find, and parking isn't easy, um, but thank you for joining us. So good evening, and welcome to the Harvard Stem Cell Institute series of public forums and tonight's discussion on the religious perspectives on stem cell research. Thank you not only for coming, but also to our guests for participating in the discussion. By way of brief in introduction, I am Brock Reeve. I'm the executive director of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. And from its inception, the institute was established to unite the schools of Harvard as well as the affiliated hospitals to build on the capability of stem cell biology to cure ma major chronic and degenerative diseases. So this quest, the quest for that cure, is not only a multidisciplinary scientific effort, but a multidisciplinary effort overall, multidisciplinary meaning that we have to address the policy, the ethical, and legal questions that come along with that science that, that we're talking about. So it's only fitting that tonight's discussion is, in fact, held at the Divinity School, although I hope in this discussion we do sh shed more light than heat on the discussion despite the temperature here. So this intersection of science and religion is not fundamentally new. Um, we can see this when you know, the ancient Greeks in the second century BC, as well as Copernicus in the 16th century, dealt with the implications of a heliocentric view of the universe. Um, similarly, we can see this when Darwin first uh, articulated his theory of evolution in the mid 1800s. And we can see this now as we talk about some of the issues raised by our new understandings um, that come uh, as a result of progress in developmental biology. But each time, as we learn more about the world and the way it works, or at least the way we think it works, um, new questions come up, and these questions need to be discussed. And we hope that tonight's discussion, and, and we very much mean it to be a discussion with all of us, is part of that larger discussion. So this evening, we're joined by leading thinkers from several different religious traditions, as well as two of uh, the Stem Cell Institute's uh, scientist faculty. And the discussion will be led by Professor Philip Clayton, who will introduce the participants in turn. But first, let me introduce uh, Professor Clayton himself. So Professor Clayton is a guest professor of science and religion at the Harvard Divinity School and is well suited for this conversation because he holds a triple appointment at Claremont in the Department of Religion, the Department of Philosophy, and at the Claremont School of Theology. Previous teaching posts include Williams College and the California State University. He's also held guest professorships at the University of Munich and the University of Cambridge. He has published widely in the philosophy of science, the history of modern philosophy, religious studies, and theology. And the central focus of his work has been on the relationship between science and religion. And he's widely recognized as one of the leading uh, figures in this field. He received a joint doctorate in religious studies and philosophy from Yale. And since that time, and we won't tell them when that time was, uh, he has written or edited 15 books and over 100 articles in the field. And his latest book on biology and the question of human freedom will appear later this year. So in short, he is the perfect person to lead tonight's discussion. Philip. Thanks very much. Welcome this evening. Tonight, we take on one of the best known debates in bioethics today. It's also a high stakes debate for both sides. Proponents argue that stem cell research holds the potential for some of the greatest medical and scientific breakthroughs of our time. Stem cell technologies may assist doctors in the treatment of a long list of diseases, including Parkinson's and some forms of diabetes. It's also fundamental research that holds the promise of extending our understanding of the building blocks of life with vast implications across the scientific disciplines. But opponents point out the potential costs are just as high. If the blastocyst is metaphysically indistinguishable from other human persons, despite its physical differences, then sacrificing it for research clashes with the fundamental principle of the inviolability of a human life. It may be tantamount, some say, to infanticide. At best, the medical use of fertilized embryos sets one down the slippery slope of exploitation and abuse. 
different religious traditions have responded differently to the ethical questions raised by stem cell research. Indeed, as you'll see, deep divisions arise even within particular religious traditions. Our goal tonight is not consensus. It is rather to understand the core motivations and assumptions that lead different religious individuals within different religious traditions to different conclusions, sometimes vastly different conclusions on this topic. Our hope is to generate, as Brock said, more heat than light, more clarity than confusion, to, ach to achieve a sharper sense of where the fundamental issues lie in the religious assessment of stem cell research. We are fortunate to have four authorities on this topic to address you this evening and two medical specialists in stem cell research to assist us with the technical questions. The four speakers have agreed to hold their comments to a strict 10-minute time limit, and I'll remind each one of them at eight minutes. After their opening statements and a brief time of discussion among the panel, we'll open up the forum to you, the audience. I introduce them in their order of speaking. Eric Cohen is executive director of the Tikva Fund, a foundation devoted to Jewish ideas and culture, and founding editor and editor-at-large of the New Atlantis, a journal on the moral implications of modern science and technology. An adjunct fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, his articles and essays have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Commentary, First Things, the Hastings Center Report, and many others. He also served for five years as a senior advisor to the President's Council on Bioethics. Omar Sultan Haq holds degrees in religious studies and neuroscience from Brown University and an MTS in Islamic studies and comparative religion from Harvard Divinity School. He's currently completing his studies at Harvard Medical School and beginning a PhD program in religious studies at Brown University specializing in this topic. <coughs> professor John Jefferson Davis is professor of systematic theology. Um, by the way, I'm introducing him from my left on a cross. So you can put a face with the introduction. Uh, professor of Systematic Theology and Christian Ethics at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. He serves as chair of the Division of Christian Thought. In addition to numerous articles on theology and ethics, Professor Davis is the author of two major texts, Evangelical Ethics and Frontiers of Science and Faith. An ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church USA, Professor Davis has been awarded a grant from the NIH for his research in genetic engineering. He's a leading evangelical specialist in questions of biomedical ethics. Reverend Dr. Lely Smith holds degrees from Smith College, Harvard Divinity School, and Andover Newton. She's an ordained pastor in the United Church of Christ with decades of ministry experience serving a number of churches. She has also served as adjunct faculty at Yale Divinity School and Andover Newton Theological School. She also brings extensive chaplaincy experience from Children's Hospital Boston, as well as serving on many regional and national committees and advisory groups. A brief word about the two uh, Stem Cell Institute faculty members who are with us tonight. Dr. Jerry Ritz is professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and senior physician in the Stem Cell Transplantation Program at the Dana-Faber Cancer Institute and Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's a member of the executive committee and principal faculty of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. Dr. Willie Lynch is an instructor in the Division of Hematology Oncology, Children's Hospital, Boston, and the Department of Biological Chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology at the Harvard Medical School. Dr. Lynch is also an affiliate of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. Both doctors have extensive experience in stem cell research and will be able to help us with medical, procedural, and technological questions that arise. So with no further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Cohen. Well, thank you very much. Uh, given the Levitical discipline we're under here, I'll dispense with the preliminaries. Oh, divine justice, since we started about 60 minutes late, it seems that the four speakers should divide that up and uh, take four extra minutes. Uh, uh, it's a great privilege to be at Harvard. It's obviously uh, at the forefront of both uh, biological science and inquiries into religion, and it's a great uh, thrill and very gratifying to see those two disciplines, those two great inquiries of human civilization uh, meeting in conversation uh, tonight. Uh, two quick disclaimers, I guess, about me. I have spent the past five years or so, until about a month ago, advising the White House and the President's Council on Bioethics. And, 
much of my perspective on these questions comes from that experience, uh, where great moral ideas and moral philosophy uh, met complicated questions of public life. Uh, secondly, while I now, as of a month ago, am running a foundation devoted to Jewish thought and Jewish culture, I am not in any way a Jewish scholar. Uh, there are serious Jewish scholars at Harvard Divinity School, uh, and so if any of them are here, I forgive me in advance. Um, the old joke has it that wherever you have two Jews, you have at least three opinions. Uh, and on most things, I think that's true, whether it's keeping kosher, who's Jewish, the wisdom of doing intermarriages, whether you can drive on the Sabbath, whether you should even keep the Sabbath, whether a brand of cheese is kosher or not, uh, passionate disagreement. The one issue in the last few years, or at least one of the many, one of the few issues that seems to have united all segments of mainstream Judaism, reform, conservative, and orthodox, is enthusiasm for embryonic stem cell research. And not only enthusiasm for it, but a belief that uh, Jews and the Jewish movement should be outspoken about it, and not only outspoken, but should call for public funding for embryo-destructive uh, research. Uh, so I'll try to argue, I think, this advocacy is uh, misguided, both on sort of political democratic grounds and on moral uh, philosophical grounds. And I would note just as an aside, the Bush policy on stem cell funding, much derided as a ban on stem cell research, I think you can make a pretty compelling case, is actually embodies a kind of religious pluralism. It doesn't fund embryo-destructive research. It doesn't ban embryo-destructive research. It lets uh, people of conscience, at least as a practical matter, uh, decide for themselves uh, what moral ideals and what religious ideals should govern them. I guess the big argument I want to make then tonight, since it's also, I guess, to Harvard's credit or discredit that they've invited me to talk a bit about the Jewish perspective on these things, uh, which I'm kind of a dissenter on, I guess, um, is to argue that there's a tension between Jewish opinion on the stem cell question and what I'll tentatively call, uh, since I, again, am no scholar of Judaism, not even fit to carry the water of real scholars of Judaism, but a tension between Jewish opinion and Jewish wisdom on these matters. Let me try to state as fairly and clearly as I can what I would call the Jewish opinion on these matters uh, and what I would call the two roots of enthusiasm from a Jewish perspective uh, for embryonic stem cell research. First is the, the high place that the Jewish tradition places on life and on healing and on medicine and on the good of medicine, uh, a, a place that it rightfully deserves not only in the Jewish tradition but in all uh, great humanistic and religious traditions uh, where all patients, potential patients, soon to be patients, all of us except for those who are taken suddenly from life uh, will one day suffer and put our first hope in medicine, if not our only hope in medicine. And so we have to sympathize with this great moral aspiration to heal. The second root, I think, of the Jewish enthusiasm for embryonic stem cell research is its understanding, at least as it's interpreted by most um, leading or preeminent or influential Jewish thinkers about the standing of nascent human life. Uh, this is a vast oversimplification of that opinion and that thinking, uh, but the basic premise is that uh, status is accrued, it's not there from the beginning, that 40 days marks a kind of morally significant point, 40 days be uh, something that has a status in Jewish law that before 40 days nascent life is more like water, after that it becomes something more significant. And so this appeal to a certain interpretation of Jewish law and a kind of intuition that when you encounter these embryos, they don't seem like the suffering parent with Alzheimer's or the suffering spouse with Parkinson's disease, uh, that these embryos don't seem like much uh, and that if we can use them in the noble cause of healing the sick, uh, our intuitions tell us that we ought to do so. That, I think, is a succinct and an effort at a kind of fair-minded statement of Jewish opinion on this matter. Uh, now let me move to my critique, what I see is the problem with Jewish opinion on this matter. First is that we face a novel situation that I don't think rabbinical authorities of uh, centuries and millennia past really could anticipate in its moral fullness. Now if I were truly orthodox, I guess I should believe that the rabbis sort of anticipated everything and that the law actually does deal with everything. Uh, I guess I'm sort of not quite that orthodox. Um, the existence of the embryo outside the body, there to be held with human hands and beheld by human eyes, is a kind of novelty. And I think it's a moment in human history, scientific, moral, civilizational history, that we're only beginning to understand. Uh, it only is a few decades old, um, but for the first time we now encounter the embryo outside the body. 
Now, of course, there's lots of complicated Jewish law and Jewish thinking on the abortion question, on when abortion is morally permissible, uh, while relevant in the sense of an effort to think carefully and morally about the standing of nascent human life in general, it seems to me not the most relevant way to think about the embryo research question uh, and the issue of whether we should use human embryos in research. Abortion is most permissible or most clearly permissible in Jewish law when the developing life is a kind of aggressor or pursuer uh, of the person in whose womb that life is. Uh, in the case of embryo research, the embryo is not an aggressor or a pursuer, but a bystander, and I would argue an innocent bystander. Um, and uh, get into exodus and deliberate killing versus accidental killing and all that. Maybe we'll have time for that in discussion. But I think we face a kind of novel situation that simply rote appeals to Jewish law don't help us with. And what we need to do is study the Jewish sources and have a kind of moral imagination that guides us. And that's what I would call Jewish wisdom, which I'll get to in a second. The real crux of the problem, I think, with Jewish opinion is that you can't hunger for and call for the benefits of modern biological science in the form of stem cell research without confronting the facts that modern science has given us about modern embryology. Uh, 40 days is simply not a significant moment. Um, it may be to the rabbis, but it's not in fact. Uh, what we know now from modern embryology, from the, the advances in modern science, is that at the moment of conception, you have a new human organism, a life in process, a life unfolding. It's what all of us looked like at that moment of our existence. None of us were ever sperm or egg, and the sperm or egg that created us Another accident of history could have been half of someone else, so to speak, uh, but we were all human embryos, even at that first moment of division. This is a scientific fact. It doesn't settle the moral question, and we need to reason morally and philosophically to think about what our moral obligations are, but you can't call for the fruits of science without confronting the facts of science, and I think too much Jewish opinion on this matter has done that. So what might a Jewish wisdom sort of look like on this? And let me quickly, what do I have, about four two minutes? minutes? Two minutes. Two minutes. I've got to do this fast. Uh, I was going to quote to you various sources from the Zohar, from the Talmud. The sources don't cut all in one direction, in fact. Um, and uh, maybe we can have time for that later. But I think there are four dimensions to Jewish wisdom, and tentative Jewish wisdom on, on the embryo question. The first is the notion that all human beings are created in the image of God. And I think what this is at the bottom is a radical teaching about human equality, that even those who don't seem like very much bear the imprint of their creator and therefore have a kind of elevated dignity, small and weak, young and old, disabled and very abled, we all equally bear that image of God, and that gives us a kind of understanding in the world. The second element, I think, of Jewish wisdom on these questions is the correction of our vision, uh, the correction of our sight. And in fact, I think Leon Cass and others have written about this, not in the bioethics context, but that the, the creation story the, the, is in fact a kind of denigration of sites and an establishment of moral authority separate from sites. Uh, uh, we have uh, foliage before the sun, the sun being the god we might have worshipped, but our eyes, alas, could lead us astray. Uh, I think we need to try to see the embryos, if I can put it this way, in the way that God sees us. In the eyes of God, if there is a God, we can't seem like very much. And yet the reason that we feel so compelled to heal one another is because we are something. It's the love we also hold, obviously hold for one another. Uh, but uh, perhaps God sees a kind of majesty in these tiny embryos uh, that uh, we would be better to try to see ourselves. The third dimension, I think, of Jewish wisdom on this is the dangers of defining a class of human beings as unworthy of life. Now, I think comparisons of embryo research to the Holocaust are terribly misguided, and I think uh, not wise. That said, the easy dismissal of these comparisons I also think is misguided. Destroying embryos and the noble cause of uh, curing disease is not the equivalent of the mass systematic slaughter of our brothers and sisters and husbands and wives. Uh, but it is at our peril that we define a class of human beings, even embryos that don't seem like much, as things to be used. And I think Jews especially should understand that teaching. The final dimension, I think, of Jewish wisdom on these is about the meaning of human procreation. The reason these embryos exist outside the body in the first place is the burden and the horror of infertility and the desire to, through in vitro fertilization, overcome that terrible burden. And this is an old story. This is, in fact, arguably the paradigmatic biblical story, uh, is the problem of infertility and the desire to overcome it. But in a way, we've abandoned the teaching about the deep meaning and dignity of human procreation. By slaying the embryo in the name of healing ourselves, in a way we're voting against the next generation, which is, I think, 
the right answer to our mortality, the deepest Jewish answer to our mortality, is the possibility and hope that is embodied in the next generation. And by creating human embryos, two sentences, I'll be done. Uh, by creating human embryos solely to use them and destroy them, I think is the kind of ultimate act of ingratitude uh, for human procreation. And I think it's no coincidence that the most death-defying civilization in human history is also the least fertile and most child-denying civilization in human history. So what I hope is that conversations like this the creativity of science and finding other ways to do stem cell research, the moral wisdom of religion and trying to set certain kinds of moral guidelines, and the search for a way to do stem cells on a ground that all citizens can embrace uh, is the way forward. And I think conversations like this will hopefully inform uh, rather the, uh, a debate that has been uh, impressive at times and unfortunate at times. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'll uh, let's get right to it. I don't want to get in trouble here for going over. But I think as we go, you'll see some of the differences between uh, my view and Eric's. Um, what I'll do briefly is tr outline the traditional view, uh, some contemporary perspectives, and then my own. So usually if you hear Muslims talking about contemporary problems, you'll hear some people saying this is a conservative issue and we, we're more liberal over here. We want to bring uh, some kind of new interpretation to the world. On this issue, it's, it's unique in some senses because what you find is some of the most conservative people actually arguing for the what we would consider liberal positions in the West here. Um, it's a novel technology. 1998, I believe, was the first time uh, you know the, the research really started got going. Um, the Muslim world has largely been a, a small contributor to the research. I think in one estimate, uh, one percent of of the entire genetics research is by the Muslim world combined, which is half of Belgium. So uh, some of the perspectives are still evolving and still growing, and there are limitations in these views. But in general, uh, I mean, when I think about you know, speaking to, uh, to a Western audience about this, there's no Vatican in Islam. There's distributed authority. There's no one source of definitive and uh, supreme meaning, although you have local constituencies. Just a background note to keep in mind. So most of the opinions in the tradition, uh, there's nothing explicit in the Quran or the Hadith about either abortion, stem cell research, anything. Um, although abortion has historically been permissible by most jurists, uh, which is because most presuppose a gradualist perspective on personhood. And these are derived through things such as um, uh, if somebody assaults a pregnant woman, what's the penalty? And, and they derive different penalties based on when she's assaulted and the baby dies. So from that, a lot of people argue about abortion and stem cell issues. Um, but almost everybody argues in terms of ensoulment, which um, in the West is considered, from the Catholic perspective, a conception. In Islam, it's 120 days or 40 days. Some people argue based on when, uh, how to interpret different sources. But in general, nobody disagrees on, if you say you're 120, nobody's going to get mad at you. You say you're 40. It's, it's okay. Um, the descriptions I'll skip over because you can read about them there in the Quran. Some of the descriptions of development from uh, a drop of semen to a clot of blood to a lump of flesh, and then you know, the soul comes in. People disagree about when that happens. Um, the limitation to this view is that this, this idea of conception was formed basically on um, intuitive signs of perceptible motion or uh, movement. So when the mother started to be able to see that the, something was going on in there and it wasn't just... Uh, too many baklava, whatever. So uh, moderns can critique that. But assuming we're not going to critique that, most people find reproductive cloning absolutely impermissible. I don't think anybody um, that I've, I've researched for this talk have found it uh, okay. Most people see it as uh, abnegation or a usurpation of divine will, and most uh, affirm legal heterosexual marriages. So it's a curious thing. You'll, f you'll hear people say, such as this one Saudi uh, sheikh I, I found, which is the lowest penalty imposed for doing uh, reproductive cloning is uh, amputation of hands and feet. But he gives an alternative. Otherwise, it should be executed. But the same guy will, will allow reproductive cloning, I, I mean uh, re research cloning or therapeutic cloning, which is entirely interesting. Sheikh Hardawi, the guy who's known for sanctifying suicide bombing, supports reproductive cloning, I mean uh, therapeutic cloning. So there's this curious mix going on. Um, you know, just as just as uh, that's an interesting point. So some of the major bodies that have come to this question, um, recently the UN had some debates about the question, and most of the Muslim countries actually abstained from the, the uh, recommendation that would have banned cloning. 
um, in, uh, prominent Egyptian muftis uh, at Al Hazar University in Cairo, uh, Singapore, Malaysia. A, a lot of people have come forth and said we, we will allow research cloning. Some disagree. For example, Malaysians say as long as you destroy it at, by 120 days, which is interesting because they're actually concerned about uh, actually producing clones rather than protecting embryos. Uh, Iran, even Ayatollah Khamenei, publicly congratulated and received researchers who had uh, created human embryonic stem cell research, uh, uh, embryos. As far as leftover uh, IVF spare embryos, quote unquote spare embryos, uh, the majority opinion is also that this would be allowed within the first 14 days. Uh, some do say they believe that uh, sanctity or person who begins a conception. So there's some debate about this, but in general, the majority opinion is, is strong. Um, larger concerns of the tradition are uh, the context within, within which such uh, procedures would take place. Like I said, uh, legal heterosexual marriages that the owner of a sperm, for example, an IVF, has to be matched with the uh, woman who donates the egg, that um, genetic descent and paternity are maintained, uh, social justice, distribution, these other concerns are, are also uh, central. I think one of the, the concerns that haven't been really resolved in America is how you would uh, obtain the oocytes for uh, SCNT. Uh, in general, the issue with Islamic law is that the idea of public necessity or maslaha is very uh, prominent. It's the idea that even the impermissible is made permissible in times of necessity. So even the most sacrosanct of, of laws can be overturned if, you, if public good is so important. And I think a lot of people, even if they had to argue for this, would argue for that uh, that stem cell research is in this category. But it's a double-edged sword because, uh, for example, Osama bin Laden uses the same necessity when he, when he argues that it's so important that we you get these people out of uh, Saudi Arabia that we can kill c civilians. But uh, so it goes both ways. Now, my own ideas uh, on this, as, as a scientist, I think the greatest therapeutic potential is clearly still from somatic cell nuclear transfer. Uh, adult stem cells seem to still be lineage restricted. Uh, because of customization and immune direction problems, uh, which haven't been overcome. Uh, even, I think, somatic cell nuclear transfer is, is better than IV, uh, spare IVFs. Cell fusion, reprogramming of adult stem cells to pluripotency, these are great ideas. They have not yet been uh, established as, as uh, promising. So where I disagree with the tradition is probably on the metaphysics of the ensoulment, which uh, seems to be in tension with some of its own claims about gradual development. That aside, it doesn't matter because most people agree with uh, re research cloning. So um, in general, I'd say I agree with the conservative opinion, even though I would disagree on, others, on other things. Out of pr principles of public necessity, um, echoing similar arguments, why allow 7 to 12,000 embryos to go to hospital waste? Um, I don't think an embryo is a full human person. I don't think anybody who does actually acts this way. Eric's example, the Holocaust just shows that he doesn't actually believe that. Um, I agree that uh, embryo is nascent human life. It is part of our family. Uh, you know, we were all an embryo, but not every embryo will be one of us. And that uh, is an important point to remember. A lot of things happen. Uh, a lot of them are destroyed before con uh, implantation. So there's clearly, you, the moral lines are not as clear as, as some would say. And moral status would not be about species membership. Uh, we're not talking about another species. We're not talking about frog embryos. We're talking about humans, yes. But uh, moral status is more than this. It's about agency, consciousness, sentience, interaction with the environment. Whatever you want to define it hasn't really, there's no consensus about these issues, how you define personhood. But the, the key mem issue is that just because uh, an embryo is a member of our species, it does not mean that it ha has the same moral status as a child with diabetes. And this is also shown in the fact that conservatives who argue for this position would never allow, would still allow abortion to save a mother's life. Why would you do that if you didn't think there was any meaningful distinctions between personhood as not intrinsically valuable? Uh, now, the argument from potential, that an embryo might be a potential human being. Um, it's, it's often argued that, uh, that IVF spares could be adopted. The one, that's, that's actually a very promising, but not really, because it's such a small, minuscule number that have been adopted. So in, in all reality and purposes, a realist about this would say, unadopted IVF spares do not have potential for becoming humans. Uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer embryos, uh, also by research, for example, by Dr. Yanish and others, they don't, may not have the same potential to become um, human life because of many uh, 
epigenetic dysregulatory problems like uh, you know, genomic imprinting. So in conclusion, uh, even if we grant intermediate moral status, which is kind of a nice thing to do because people are arguing let's kind of stick to the middle, intermediate moral status to the embryo, deliberately destroying them with regulations and under the equally if not greater moral demand of affirming the moral status and needs of the living, sentient and suffering children with diabetes, for example, whose moral status that no one would debate is consistent with respecting the moral status of an embryo, which, after all, is intermediate. <laughs> Finally, it's often said that uh, utilitarians are irresponsible because um, they lack empathy or they lack, ex you know, they lack empathy in making moral decisions. I think the human embryonic stem cell case um, is a pretty good example of how you can have irresponsible deontology also. Uh, which has its excesses if it's misplaced with, with a misplaced abundance of empathy, um, which ignores any notion of a deontic threshold um, or the necessity of trade-offs in amongst competing moral demands. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the uh, Harvard Stem Cell Institute for arranging this forum. It's a rare opportunity, I think, for religious scholars and uh, medical scientists to engage on matters of uh, huge public policy importance. Uh, I'm ordained in the Presbyterian Church USA, so I, I'm coming from uh, a Christian and Protestant point of view, theologically uh, quite conservative, and uh, the position I'm trying to articulate here would also be shared by many, not all, but uh, many conservative Roman Catholics and Orthodox Christians as well. So uh, some of you may have my hand out there, and what I want to propose uh, for discussion tonight is that uh, three very commonly recognized principles of medical ethics, namely do no harm to human subjects, number two, treat human subjects equally, and three, treat human subjects as ends in themselves, not merely as means for the ends of others, uh, should be applied to embryonic humans or human embryos. So what I'm going to propose for discussion is that uh, uh, I think, at least I, I've concluded, and I, I want to share briefly my reasoning with you, that uh, there are plausible philosophical, scientific, and theological uh, arguments to support the uh, personhood from conception uh, point of view. Now, let me just uh, say a word about uh, the, the theological approach uh, to this, and uh, I've tried to articulate my position more fully in an article, The Moral Status of the Embryonic Human Religious Perspectives in Ethics and Medicine, uh, Volume 22, in which I uh, exegete uh, texts in the Hebrew Bible, such as Psalm 139, and also the infancy narratives in the uh, Christian Bible. But uh, Psalm 139, uh, I believe, shows God's uh, personal interest in and uh, relationship to the preborn and developing human beings. So what I try to do theologically there from the perspective of Christian theology is to really argue for a relational ontology of the person and say that really uh, personhood of all sorts is inherently relational in nature and from a Christian perspective related to uh, the Trinity, and especially to the Incarnation. And so in my uh, exegesis of Christian texts like uh, Luke chapter 1, in which the Incarnation of Jesus Christ is des described, and uh, most famously, uh, I think, summarized in the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, that Jesus Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. So from the perspective of Christian theology, one could say that, well, uh, Jesus Christ, the archetypal human in Christian theology, in fact, the second Adam, who is to be the pattern and the paradigm of humanity as the creator intended it, then uh, his human trajectory begins at conception and exemplifies the divine intent that uh, human beings live in uh, covenantal relationship with the, cre with the creator and that their basic existence or orientation is the giving and uh, receiving of love. Okay, so it's really an argument from uh, the incarnation, the work of the Holy Spirit, and uh, Christian theological categories, well, also Jewish theological categories, such as adoption and uh, sonship or daughtership, as we might say today. But, of course, I fully realize that in a pluralistic culture uh, like ours uh, appeals to holy texts 
uh, from whatever religious tradition might not have a lot of traction in terms of public policy. So as I've reflected on these things, I've tried to also develop uh, some purely secular and philosophical arguments uh, that I think may have some plausibility in, in construing uh, the embryonic uh, human being uh, as or should have per be recognized as having personal status. And just a few words about that. I would also observe, I think, that it's probably historically true that the concept of person, okay, uh, has certainly uh, gone through a long process of social evolution over the centuries, and that our, our concept of the person who we recognize or who any culture recognizes as a human being or a human person uh, is heavily uh, cult uh, influenced by historical and cultural circumstances. You know, for example, when uh, white Europeans arrived in uh, the Americas in the 15th and 16th centuries, a lot of the uh, uh, European colonizers had great difficulty in recognizing the Native Americans as human beings or persons because of difference of appearance and uh, physiog physiognomy and uh, culture, language, uh, and so forth and so on. And so it was only actually uh, four centuries later that uh, American law actually conferred full legal recognition to Native Americans, uh, granting Native Americans the right to vote in 1924. So uh, I would invoke the analogy of uh, ethnocentrism, that oftentimes uh, any culture's recognition of who is a member of the human community uh, can be deflected by ethnocentric uh, considerations. They, the other does not look like us. Okay, so I would just suggest here that, uh, as a matter of fact, what, I, what I'm proposing is that uh, in this debate, we need to revision, we need to see embryonic human beings in a different way and to recognize them for what they really are. So what I'm really for arguing for is a fundamental ontology of the person. And I would say that the, the fundamental moral issue in the debate is the ontology or the metaphysical status of the human embryo, or I would rather say the embryonic human. Okay, that's already encapsulating uh, my discussion there. So from the purely philosophical point of view, I propose the, the following uh, definition of the person. You have it there in the handout. I propose that a human subject, okay, or a human person, uh, the subject of possible legal rights, uh, could be understood as a living individual of the species Homo sapiens with an inherent capacity, note the word capacity, to exhibit the developmental processes and uh, characteristic of the species. And what I'm trying to do in this definition is to challenge uh, what I would consider ethnocentric uh, understandings of the person uh, that say, well, look, you know, this, this blastocyst does not look like any of us. Well, you know, granted. But uh, then I would say that, well, this is what uh, the human subject looks like at that stage in development. This is typical. This is normal. This is what I look like at that stage of development. And it may be simply our culture's lack of familiarity with the other, okay, uh, due to all these historical and cultural situations that allows us to or, or inhibits us from seeing uh, this entity for what it really is, and namely sort of a, a self-contained, rather remarkable piece of nanotechnology with an internal trajectory uh, to exhibit and manifest under the pr uh, appropriate circumstances uh, the attributes of personhood that our culture already recognizes, such as linguistic ability, moral reasoning, moral awareness, consciousness, and so forth. In other words, I'm saying that consciousness is not the essence of the person, okay, but that consciousness arises out of the being of the person. So I'm arguing for a fundamental ontology of the person. Uh, in my article, Human Embryos Twinning in Public Policy, also in Ethics and Medicine, I, I try to uh, apply... Okay, the methodology of uh, John Rawls and uh, theory of justice, uh, in which he says, well, if uh, in a situation of a moral contest you don't know what moral rules to apply, you can have a hypothetical thought experiment, invoke uh, the rule of or the veil of ignorance, and the original position, in, in which the moral agents don't know what original position in the new hypothetical society uh, they would occupy. So in this thought experiment, if, for example, we're trying to make the rules concerning stem cell research, 
if the moral agents could be assigned either the position of a medical researcher with an interest in stem cell research or be assigned the position of a human embryo, well, what, what rules might one plausibly want to invoke? So I would say that, well, okay, ceteris paribus, uh, let's uh, protect all human subjects equally, okay? So that, that's, that's sort of a Rawlsian argument from the original position, veil of ignorance, and uh, related to the principle, treat all human subjects uh, equally. So I think this would also reach considerations of uh, utility, and I would be the last to deny as a Christian theologian that there is, in fact, great social benefit, or there could be great social benefit, positive utility from uh, harvesting uh, embryonic uh, stem cells. Uh, however, I would say that uh, uh, there would be greater loss uh, there would, in fact, be uh, negative trade-offs here and that our society is wise, especially at this, as we are facing the full momentum of the emerging biotechnology re uh, revolution to try to protect all human subjects against whatever you know, well-intentioned uh, therapeutic intent, economic interest, and whatnot, so that uh, human persons are not unnecessarily or unintentionally commodified. Thank you very much. The United Church of Christ has repeatedly called for a Christian response to developments in genetic technology at its general synods. In 2001, it passed a resolution that, quote, encourages the associations and local churches to provide opportunities and resources for their members to become informed about developments in genetic technology and the moral, ethical, social, and theological implications raised by these developments. Our website makes public the testimony of Ronald Cole Turner to the National Bioethics Advisory Commission as a member of the United Church of Christ, opening with the point that no one individual speaks for the denomination. The professor of ethics at Princeton Theological Seminary indicates that the UCC Committee on Genetics do not object categorically to human pre-embryo research, provided the research is well justified in terms of its objectives, that the research protocols show proper respect for the pre-embryos, and that they are not implanted. Cole Turner goes on to say that these areas of research must be pursued, if at all, within the framework of broad public discussion. Highly defined research protocols can more responsibly be conducted, regulated, and monitored where honest and sustained discourse brings forth all views, including problematic issues. The question must be asked, how will the benefits be shared universally? Will public funding mean that huge expenses will be justified in the global health care context? And how will various emerging technologies such as nuclear transfer and human germline modification be considered in relation to stem cell research. The emphasis for Ron Cole Turner is on public discussion of emerging ethical choices. Karen Labax, ethics professor from the Pacific School of Religion, picks up the ethical issues, noting that questions of justice need to be addressed and asking who will get the benefits if regenerative therapies do result from stem cell research. And she emphasizes the central United Church of Christ belief that benefits should be available to all ancestral groups and especially to those whose histories have left a legacy of poverty and ill health. She points up the issue of compromised freedom and potential exploitation of women as donators of eggs. Labax is well aware of the risks in clinical trials and recognizes the pressure to proceed too quickly, bypassing the lengthy system of animal trials. She reminds us of unintended consequences that stem cells, precisely because they continue to proliferate, can cause tumors. In theological terms, Labax echoes the UCC sense that 
Our loving God continues to create us, and God is still speaking. She points to the assumption that a religious sense of purpose does not rest in biological nature alone. We are formed for a life of justice and compassion in relationships. The Reformed tradition holds assumptions that shape the views of Cole Turner and Labax. Max Stackhouse, UCC ethicist at Princeton Theological Seminary, explains how these play out in debates. First, our tradition relies on biblical and theological themes to interpret the forces, structures, and processes of social history, and therefore to define the normative possibilities which could guide the people of God. Natural law is not a prime category for us. We in the Reformed tradition speak of the fall of humankind, the radical loss of the capacity for doing good and reasoning soundly. We hold that the world is broken and sinful. Thus, we have a pessimistic view about human thirst for power, for money, for self-interest, and acclaim. At the same time, we trust in what we call grace to make possible an ultimate good. We press for the constant process of mutual dialogical correction. In the community of the faithful, the assessment and preferences in moral dilemmas will be worked out through mutual edifying and correction. The conversations should be carried out in the koinonia, the community who can trust each other in honest and sincerous discussion. The United Church of Christ provides opportunities for dialogue to take place. For example, theological colloquy at Craigville on Cape Cod explored the limits of our being co-creators with God. And we spent a week discussing such questions as, should everything that can be done be done? And how can there be a compassionate allocation of resources? The conversation turned to the invitation of Christ to share in the abundant life. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus said, when you give a party, Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Then you will be blessed. We talked about the fragile and the vulnerable, being invited to the table as members of the body of Christ. We talked about suffering and death. How do we enter into suffering as Christians rather than expect to eliminate it? How do we think about death? as if we could prevent it at all. We could appreciate the work of Dr. Kenneth Culver, who has felt called to alleviate suffering in children and work with French Anderson on the first human gene therapy experiment, cost of a million dollars. As a praying physician, Culver feels empowered to use genetic resources to help kids. The Christian emphasis on the incarnation of God and humankind has encouraged medical advances and exploration through many centuries. We also lift up the identity of the whole person, how we think about suffering and death is critical. Our false hopes and our emotional reservations are importantly involved when we take up the case for stem cell research. I've been part of conversations in congregations, in family camp, in clergy gatherings, where I see United Church of Christ people are willing to adventure cautiously into the realm of stem cell research and to proceed with compassion and intelligence and respect for creation and realistic hope. They are often stunned to learn of the risks and wary of tampering with a biological ecosphere that may introduce variations, mutations that we do not seek, such as teratomas or sickly cloned animals. 
As a pastor, I have ministered to people with drastic spinal cord injuries, Parkinson's disease, advanced childhood diabetes, brain cancer, finding a heightened sense of holiness and a deepened spirit, spirit of gratitude for life. I've prayed over many graves. I talk about the Trinity. The Trinitarian framework provides a model for our reflection. The creative source of being is beyond our understanding. God's ways are not our ways. The human Jesus has suffered and died. The Holy Spirit continually pours out wisdom, the power to love, the grace to be courageous, and to live abundantly in the beloved community of the resurrected Christ. The United Church of Christ statement declares, we believe in God who calls the worlds into being, in Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, who has shared our common lot, and in the Holy Spirit, creating and renewing the church. The persons of the Trinity model for us community in relationship, and that is how any person is defined in relationship. Even a blastocyst can be in Christian relationship. One of the foundation documents of the Reformed tradition, the Heidelberg Catechism, asks, what is your only comfort in life and in death? The response, that I belong, body and soul, life and death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And that includes my stem cells. As we face research projects and its many imponderables, we pray for guidance because there's danger and dismay, as well as therapeutic possibility on the open road ahead. And we want to keep talking. So thanks to the Harvard Stem Cell Institute for this forum. Many thanks to the four panelists who have begun our discussion tonight and for their brevity. Try doing that in 10 minutes. So uh, they have our particular support. Um, Dr. Zlinchenrich, is there anything that you would like to mention at this point regarding medical questions or scientific questions raised by the presentation so far? Okay. I come to the lectern or just... Um, why don't you just do it sitting down. From now on, the rest of you get to sit and I have to stand. Uh-huh. Thank you. And so um, hopefully my microphone is on and that everyone can hear me. I would just like to address two points that I noted in the talks, which were really wonderful, and and on behalf of both of us, thank you so much for inviting us here tonight. Uh, The the first um, actually comes from from John's talk where he described the human embryo as a self-contained entity, and I find that to be an interesting situation medically when considering that uh, the pregnant woman is the patient of an obstetrician gynecologist, and the fetus is also the patient of that same medical individual. Not until the child is born does it come to have a pediatrician, and so... I, I think that medically and developmentally, uh, I, I would add a little bit more to that, that the context of the womb is also very important for development, and just as a general uh, statement. And then the only other point that I would make uh, comes from Lely's discussion, where, um, uh, quoting Labac, I believe, uh, described the concern over the fact that stem cells may cause tumors due to their continued proliferation. And I think that this is an important <coughs> point to mention, that often... When um, I I attend public discussions or read uh, public commentary about the use of embryonic stem cells, this is raised as a concern. And it's because of a very rare type of tumor called teratoma, which Lely also mentioned. The teratoma is a a well-known clinical entity. I have um, publications in my lab from the 1600s describing teratomas. And it's this type of tumor that I'm sure people here have heard about, and no one's eating, so I'll tell you a little something about it. If you section through the teratoma, it's this type of tumor where you find hair and teeth and other sort of discombobulated aspects of human development in this tumor. And again, we've known about them medically for hundreds of years and probably knew about them, you know, at the barber shop for years before that. It's, it's a natural manifestation of abnormal germ cell development. In the laboratory, the teratoma is a very useful tool because you can form a teratoma intentionally with an embryonic stem cell, like like a mouse embryonic stem cell line or even a human one, and it tells you something about how potent it is. You look at the tissues that are in the teratoma and you have an idea of the developmental capability that that cell line had. But an important distinction here is that all of the the pieces of information that I've I've read and, and that I've also written describing the potential for 
therapy using embryo human embryonic stem cells do not intend to implant those cells because a teratoma would perhaps result. Rather, it's to direct those cells in the laboratory to differentiate, to mature, to become pancreatic cells or neurons, or in the case of my work, blood stem cells, and that those mature non-teratoma forming cells would be the ones that are intended to be implanted. The last point that I'll make quickly is that it is an interesting one to associate uh, cancers and tumors with stem cells because there's a, a very interesting uh, notion that's come about in the last 20 years that called the cancer stem cell that, that most malignancies probably originate in the stem cell, in the tissue stem cell because of all of the various tissues in the body. It's the one that has this capacity to keep chugging along and making more copies of itself. Great. That's Thank you, Dr. Thanks very much. Thanks. All right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I've, there are about 12 questions that arise out of your presentations. And what I'd like to do is sort of pose open-ended questions and allow you to respond in an open fashion to each other. If a dialogue gets going, we'll just let it happen. Uh, on the, in behalf of the audience, I'll probably ask you to stop if you go on a long time, or maybe one of your friends will um, politely interrupt. Uh, so we, we need to avoid lecturing and see how close we can come to the, to the goal of, of discussion. It might be interesting, since these debates often get dichotomized, to begin by asking the four of you about common ground. Is there common ground that you share on this topic, precisely as Christian Jew or Muslim? For example, is there any common ground on the question of respect for the blastocyst? Is that a theme that, that all of you endorsed, or were there differences between you? How, how would all of you express what you heard to be common ground that you share as members of one of the three Abrahamic faiths? Well, what I heard was that certainly I think there's sort of consensus here about uh, we would all desire therapeutic outcomes. I mean, the treatment of disease and the reduction of human suffering, I think that's certainly uh, common ground. I think there's also common ground that uh, all of us would accord some degree of respect to the developing embryonic human. The question is how much, and I think maybe you and I are in a different place there than uh, the uh, other two there. So, again, I think... Uh, from my point of view, it does resolve again to what is the fundamental nature of the entity in question, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what I would call the, on, the ontology of the embryo. And uh, but, but Can I see if the others could speak to this question of common ground? It's a nice way to begin a discussion, to find that we share something in common. It could have just been total silence and there was nothing, but anyone else want to respond on common ground that you perceived? Yeah, I agree. It's just a mm -hmm. matter of uh, whether you think, whether, you know, how much and under what circumstances such things are um, amenable to being traded off. Um, yeah. Okay, let me make things less nice then. Uh, Wait, uh, could, I, could I ask you to pause just for a second and ask about one other question, which is sotto voce in your I presentation. I tried. And that is social justice. All of you mentioned that theme and it, in, some, in one way or another. I wonder if you could say something about that in the way it might form some, some common ground. And then on to the differences with Eric. Lully, you, you emphasize it most explicitly, perhaps. Well, yeah, I think that it's such an expensive prospect mm -hmm. to develop, and it's going to take quite a while, but it is going to uh, be very limited as to who can benefit from this. Mm -hmm. So who's going to decide that, and uh, what other use could be put to the money that would be more just? I mean, more, more people die of diarrhea in the world than anything else, and if you were addressing... Those issues, mm -hmm. you know, that's a justice issue, I'd say. Right. Others? Right. I think there's a justice level at that issue. Uh, and also at, at another level, I mean, we want to maximize therapeutic outcomes on the one hand, but without uh, destroying individual human rights. So, you know, the, this tension between mm -hmm. uh, positive social outcomes without violating individual human rights, again, mm -hmm. I think devolves to the question of, well, what, what agents or what entities are subjects of rights? Okay, and I, I, mm -hmm. again, that, that divides the panel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Okay. Eric wanted to jump in. Well, I'll, I'll begin making things less nice by starting with the question of common ground. I think the, the principle that I think, I suspect anyway, everyone on the panel does agree upon and holds dear is the idea of human equality. I don't think there's anyone here who's going to make a case against the argument against human equality. I think the issue is that it runs in different directions. For the most passionate advocates for embryonic stem cell research, in a way what I think they're after is trying to restore a kind of equality that nature herself denies. 
What could be more unjust than the sick child with yeah. a terrible disease that the stem cell biologist wants to cure? Um, and so there's a desire to give everyone an equal chance at a full and flourishing life through the ingenuity of modern science. I think everybody sh believes in this principle of human equality. The problem is that there's a kind of constraint, um, the constraint that you can't use some lives as tools to help others, that even the weak and the disabled and the embryonic that don't seem like much possess a kind of fundamental human equality that should constrain us. Uh, and so I think while we all agree on this ideal of human equality, uh, I would I not think, agree with that. But. Well, three out of four maybe. Maybe no one agrees. I'm trying to <laughs> make the, the, the not being nice start with a common no, principle that we have to argue about. Um, but uh, quickly on the issue of respect, which mm -hmm. you raise more. Uh, I think this language of special respect has, in fact, been used very irresponsibly in the public debate. It was, it's mm -hmm. been introduced by numerous people. The, the Clinton Bioethics Council has spoken this language of special respect uh, for embryonic life. But oftentimes, the same people who argue that embryonic life deserves special respect are advocating things like research cloning, which requires the deliberate creation of human embryos solely for research purposes. So for you, I just think it's incompatible to claim that embryos deserve even a middling special respect on the one hand, and then see them simply as things for use. We're not even talking about leftover embryos. We're talking about the deliberate creation of embryos solely for research. I think sometimes this language of special respect is used as a kind of polite cover for full steam ahead. Okay, thanks, sir. Omar, you want to jump in? Can you I, I don't think people who advocate this position actually believe what they say because everybody acts as if, people speak as if they believe in this, but they don't. It's anytime you allow a mother to have an abortion because she's in danger of dying, you don't believe in human equality. You believe that there's equalities premised on a notion of development, a notion of sentience, uh, a developmental notion of personhood. Um, if Eric doesn't believe in the genocide is the same as uh, throwing away millions of embryos, then he doesn't believe in equality as, a, as an ontological feature of a group of cells. He believes that, uh, you know, it's a bad thing to happen, but in reality people act as if they trade off values when they speak as though they, they have, um, you know, an ultimate values for, the, for political purposes or, you know, I mean, just think of the Republican government. Life is valuable, but then we're going to go to the Iraq war. I mean, we're debating over 200 cells and killing millions of cells, you know. It's just, it's, it's, not about, uh, it's not about equality. It's not about ontological status. It's about on what, uh, what the threshold is for you by which you allow deontic infinite value, and what will you allow it to be traded off for that? Eric, since you were mentioned my name, do you want to respond? Uh, sure. I'll leave the Iraq war out of this. In, in that Stem cells is hard right, enough, was, you know. Uh, we, we should, uh, look, I, 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 I think your argument requires a little more uh, subtlety. Uh, first of all, I don't think we're. I think the language of personhood and saying is this per, is this being a person or not a person? How many people are killed and therefore is it or is it not equal to something as grotesque as the Holocaust is sort of misguided. Uh, the fact is, certain kinds of acts like the Holocaust could be more grotesque because of the evil they do to us as people, because of the obvious humanity of the beings that are slaughtered. The embryo, the embryo's humanity is not obvious. It is a kind of mystery. It presents itself to us as a kind of mystery. I think the question before us is: Are we going to begin a speculative project of research, promising, no doubt, uh, in the hope of sa saving life? Are we going to destroy mass numbers of embryos in the hope of one day finding a cure? The question when we're talking about embryo research is not even this sick person versus this embryo. It's we're going to destroy lots of embryos in the hope that that might one day yield a cure for future patients. Uh, and I, I think the, the, the image we always get is would you save the embryo, 50 embryos in the freezer or uh, the patient? This is just not a good way to do moral philosophy, moral thinking, to create these arbitrary triage crisis situations. Okay, thanks, uh, you can't allow uh, Davis, did you want to jump in? Well, well? Yeah, just a quick response to the abortion problem and uh, personhood from conception. You know, well-known well cases, uh, ectopic pregnancy, okay, human embryo developed. And so uh, uh, moralists would say tri triage analogy here, tragic case, uh, present state of medical technology can't save two human lives, so therefore intervene to try to save the life that can be saved. So hard, hard case, but I think it's not totally inconsistent with uh, Look, uh, personhood from conception. Yeah, thanks. Lovely. You're well, I think that the whole way you think about it, your attitude. I mean, some people begin praying for this uh, zygote as soon as it's formed, and they have a strong sense that this is a real person. And others are very, you know, get rid of this. It's tying up my life. Uh, the wonderful book that Michael Bolomo wrote that was passed out at the last one of these, 
Uh, the first example is sort of fictitious, but the woman's life is saved because of some very quickly uh, engineered development. Her, her pancreas was rescued. And she said, now I'm walking around, but you know, I feel guilty about that embryo. And I think that you're never going to get very far away from that personal feeling. Well, Lily, it does seem that there's a lot of disagreement about when personhood starts or whether we understand the embryo as a full member of the human community. Mm -hmm. You just acknowledge a wide range of views. Mm. How do we as a society live with this wide range of views? Do, are we just utterly agnostic about the matter? And, or is there some way that, that you would respond from the perspective of your church and, and tradition to well, the clear and sharp distinctions that are being raised by two of the pa panel members? Mm -hmm. I think the distinctions as to what a person in a Christian community uh, would decide for themselves and what the government should impose for everybody or not impose. I think that, you know, you can't. So it's a matter of individual decision. That's where you're. Well, I think that that um, there's got to be a law that relates to how this uh, zygote is valued. I recognize that, mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of times the decision can be an individual one. Well, thanks I very think much. To how you a question for the panel as a whole. Some commentators have said it seems to come down to an appeal to utility on the one side and deontology on the other. That the one side is the utility of stem cell research and, and that the, the opposing side is that there, there's a basic ontology and Dr. Davidson seemed to take, David seemed to take a position like that. I wonder if the panel would, would respond to that. Does it seem that the two sides are appealing to radically different types of arguments in making their cases? I, I, think, that's, uh, I think that is part of the tension. I mean, I've, I've tried to articulate a deontological starting point. So I'm, I've, I've tried to make an argument that uh, yeah, this should be recognized as part of the human community and that it's really sort of an ethnocentric bias uh, not to do so. Okay, that, that's, that's been my argument. And, but Abandon, or just bracketing my deontological starting point for a while, I would say that even from a purely uh, utilitarian standpoint, there may, there's more complexities than might appear here. Because, okay, we're going to create social utility to, uh, you know, to cure X number of cases of Parkinson's disease in the next 25 years, say. Okay? Right, but then the question is, all right, now, are you actually sacrificing how many you know, potential, what, Nelson Mandela's? We don't know. Of course, you know, human knowledge is limited. So you may be actually losing some social utility by uh, destroying uh, embryonic human beings. You just don't know. But that's, that's not just a theoretical possibility. Okay, thanks. Omar, you want to respond yeah, to that? Yeah, I think it is a matter of the ontology and utility, clearly from my talk. I, um, but I think there's bad, like I said, there's irresponsible utilitarianism and there's irresponsible deontology. And uh, not having a threshold for deontology can be just as bad as vapid utilitarianism, but I just, I just don't think that most people who argue from a deontological perspective actually follow through the conclusions of their arguments. Well, let me ask you, though, what, what's your threshold of deontology? If you say, all right, we can harvest uh, human embryos up to what? Day six, day 14, day, you know, See, that's day a good 18. question, because at least if you ask line, that question, then you have at least... We have the line drawing problem. We have the line drawing problem. Okay, Not thanks. really. Uh, Omar. Because if you, if, you, if, you, <laughs> if you allow someone to even ask that question, you've entered it into a bait of utility. You've, you've left deontology behind because deontology has its own metaphysics. But then do you, can you, on a utilitarian basis, draw a consistent line? That will protect human subjects that you don't want to sacrifice. That's what the whole debate is about. You know, how about, no, well, how about creating a human embryo that will uh, die at six months intrauterine gestation age? Why not? I don't is know it, of anything like that. But. Is it, um, Jack, is this a slippery slope argument yeah. that if one doesn't make a clear distinction right. at the beginning, one right. will be unable to come up with criteria? That's right. I'm child, I'd say the burden of proof is on the utilitarian argument to say, well, draw me a bright line, okay, okay. because I, I'm making an ontological argument for the person. Yeah, that's helpful. Lully or Omar, do you want to respond slippery to that specific slope, question? The slippery slope's not an argument. It's an observation. You can do it in both well, directions. Draw me a bright line and, though, and justify it. Well, this isn't a place to do that. We can do that later. If you oh, want. well, this is the place. Do you want to? Well, uh, without board certified philosophical credentials, I try never to use words like deontology and utilitarianism. But I'll plunge in with trepidation. Look, no one is a true utilitarian. I mean, no one would disaggregate a newborn 
uh, to save seven other newborns. Uh, we just never would do it. There are certain things we don't do, even if more lives would be benefit, because we don't destroy or use the innocent simply as things. The embryo presents a very puzzling case because it seems like so little. Uh, it presents ourselves to the human eye. It looks like almost nothing. To the untrained human eye, an embryo under the microscope looks no different to a cow embryo, a human embryo, or even an ordinary cell. Yet our moral intuitions that the embryo is different and maybe potentially a usable thing might lead us astray. And that's where I think we need moral reason and philosophical reason to think about what are our obligations in this case. Now, it may be hard to believe, and maybe we don't fully believe that the human embryo is an equal person, but I think a better question is, should we use the origins of human life? Should we use not only the seeds, but the first organisms of the next generation simply as things to heal our own? Will we be a better society or a lesser society uh, if we do that? And I'm inclined to believe that our sensibilities would be coarsened and destroyed if we come to see the beginnings of life simply as things for our use. Even if we do it with caution and trepidation, even if we do it with platitudes about special respect, I think we'll become a lesser society. We can preserve a kind of agnosticism about the mystery of the embryo and our inability to feel as attached to it as we do to the ones we love, but we also can set wise moral limits on the destruction of nascent human life simply as a tool for use. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think uh, Gilbert Mylander does a terrific description of what happens when you decide about intra, in vitro fertilization. The tremendous poignancy of a couple wanting so much to have a child, then they go and take this move, and extra embryos are created that are never going to be implanted. And uh, that, I think, is a line we have already crossed in a lot of situations. I think that's a point at which we, we need to reflect also. What is your calling? Uh, okay, I'd like to ask one final question and then open up the discussion to the audience. I've appreciated that you've been willing to offer philosophical arguments, ethical, political, scientific arguments. I think it would be helpful to ask each panel member, what is the distinctively religious argument that you most want us to take away? How does your position represent what other, are, are other arguments it may have in its favor, a distinctively religious conclusion from your tradition? Uh, could I just begin with Eric and see if or you can pass if that's not a helpful question? But I'd be interested that we understand, since our focus is on the religious dimension of the stem cell debate, what the religious contribution for you is in this debate. Uh, any question asked by the moderator is, of course, by definition, a helpful question. Let me try to answer. <laughs> um, I think there are two. Uh, I, I think this notion of image of God and the meaning of human equality and what that opposes upon us as a commandment, I think, is fundamental. Uh, look, I, 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 I think that we are arguing about whether human beings are in some sense equal or so potentially equal to us that we ought to act with restraint. And we're reasoning from a kind of first principle of human equality. You can abandon the first principle. You could simply say that the strong and flourishing ought to use the weak as their ser servants. Uh, you could say that we should save the Mozarts of the world using not only the embryos, but the lessers. Uh, so you can abandon that principle of human equality. I actually think it requires a kind of religious grounding to be sustained in a society. So that would be the first core thing. The second, quickly, would be this teaching about the meaning of human procreation. Um, and that we are talking about, uh, we need to restore the stem cell debate to its proper context, which is the d dynamic and relationship between the generations. And I think that's usually lost, and from the Jewish perspective, ought not to be. Okay, thank you, Omar. Uh, I guess uh, in uh, the Islamic legal tradition, I guess the contribution I could think most of would be uh, casuistic reasoning, legal reasoning, case-based reasoning that doesn't, that doesn't really uh, accept uh, such absolutes in practical, in practical reasoning, uh, developmental perspective on, on personhood um, and equality as nece necessarily requiring a threshold, otherwise becoming um, a menace. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Jack? Well, I guess uh, from the perspective of Christian theology, I already mentioned sort of the central idea of the incarnation, which could be seen as uh, a great demonstration of uh, God's desire to uh, have a loving relationship with humankind. So you could say that, well, the incarnation demonstrates that God loves the embryo, uh, agape, unmerited love of God for uh, the human. And I think one other inference from the Christian 
and Jewish concept of love, uh, and Islamic, I believe, would be that uh, to love the other is to intend that they exist and persist in being. Hmm. Thank you. Well, I think we've got a true moral dilemma that our tradition and our scripture does not fully address. And uh, I think that in such situations, you gather in the community and you say, what am I as a member of this community, this koinonia, to do? What am I, what are we to say as members of this community? And uh, that relationship, I think, is guiding the conversation. We are a long way from a, a clear answer, I think, and a long way from uh, successful implementation of these dreamed of therapies. Yeah. Dr. Ritz, Dr. Lynch, anything to add before we turn to the audience? I just wanted to add something about the, um, uh, I think one of the other things that we've heard is that uh, the, the, the research is there and it's moving, it's palpable, and I think that's part of what's driving this debate. And um, mm -hmm. uh, 50 years ago, uh, children with leukemia um, didn't survive. Uh, a, a week, we're talking weeks or days or weeks. Uh, now, 50 years later, 9 out of 10 children with leukemia are actually cured of their disease. Uh, 30 years ago, um, people just began, started doing adult stem cell transplants, and the results um, were not so good. Uh, but now, 50, 60, 70 percent of patients who get adult stem cell transplants are cured of their disease. Um, and I think the future, uh, that, that experience tells us about the future. Uh, Fifty years ago, couples that were infertile uh, didn't have a lot of opportunities. Uh, now we have freezers that are filled uh, with spare embryos because there are tens of thousands of couples that now have actually successfully had babies. Um, but in the process of that success and actually having had their children, um, there are there are these extra things that are there, and we don't we, we don't uh, we're not sure what to do with them. Uh, from my perspective, uh, I heard that, um, uh, <clears throat> that we, uh, um, and I certainly agree with this, all of us, all of us were those cells at some point, but I also heard that not every one of those cells, not every one of those blastocysts is going to turn out to be the next Mozart. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of them, and they we're talking about thousands of these uh, embryos, are sitting in freezers waiting to be thrown away. Mm -hmm. And should, uh, should we That's... really throw those away? Mm. Thank you, Dr. Ritz. We turn now to the audience. We have only till 8 o'clock. I want to acknowledge as many questions as possible and allow the panel to interact, please. Dr. Davis, thank you for the handout sheet. It's so convenient. I have a question about the Jewish community. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that um, the Jewish community is very important. Um, I'm going to read a little quickly. Um, more facts on the logical. Uh, what amount of a naturally occurring. Uh, okay. Thank you. What account? of uh, what amount of a naturally occurring malformation or mutation, um, say in chromosomes, for example, uh, is acceptable in order for the, um, the community member there on the uh, magazine cover to qualify as a person, as you define in number two. Um, then, after a person already is uh, recognizable and they've developed um, uh, in definition number two, and they're recognizable as a person and fully formed. And they sustain a trauma that results in them being uh, not comatose, but actually brain dead. And that person has lost their essential capacity, uh, as you define it, um, or as I think you might be defining it. Uh, are they still a person? And, uh, and then after that, what about dementia? In other words, somebody who is gradually losing their... Uh, a bill, their capacity. Right. Well, all, all of those you. are, I think, very good questions. Uh, with respect to the first one, the, I think what's generally known as the fetal wastage problem, that would uh, uh, presumably cut against the position I'm arguing. All right, suppose, for the sake of argument, 25 to 30 percent of uh, newly conceived human beings don't make it uh, to birth. I, I don't know exactly what the best case figure is, but that. 
Yeah, okay. But, uh, you know, pick a figure, say 25 or 30 percent. I think I would, that would be low, but for the sake yeah, of argument. Yeah, well, whatever. I would, I would say that, you know, genetic defects or, or whatever. Uh, but I, my observation would be that, uh, okay, human beings, uh, you know, in their lives at, uh, you know, later or early points in the life cycle for various reasons, okay, so that I would say the therapeutic impulse properly uh, uh, conceived would be to say, well, let's try to connect or try to correct any genetic defects in order to avoid that fetal wastage problem. But my observation would be that human beings, for a variety of reasons, have their lives ended, either willfully or not willfully, for a variety of reasons throughout the life cycle. Okay? So, but that, as, as a moral predicate, we want to will the continued existence of that uh, human subject so far as that's in our power. Now, with respect to the issues of, uh, you know, dementia or brain trauma, I would say that, well, here, uh, you've had a person who has experienced a trauma not of their choosing, presumably, okay? So you have here, I'll admit, uh, either impaired personhood or uh, almost, uh, you know, vanishing personhood. But I think the difference in that case is that, uh, well, Nancy Cruzun uh, or, or Terry Schiavo, for example, uh, I don't think choose, chose to have that trauma. And it's, it's, it's not as though another moral agent decided to traumatize, you know, the, the human subject for somebody else's benefit. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that why it's, it, it doesn't really cut across my deontological uh, point of view. But again, I would say my fundamental ontology of the person is that consciousness, so to speak, to use another metaphor, is the tip of the iceberg, not the whole iceberg. Where the consciousness is the fruit on the tree, it's, it's not the root. And that consciousness is, is a, an attribute or a property of the person that arises under the appropriate uh, circumstances. But that human beings, or this human being, shouldn't expect it to have certain properties that you know, human beings at other points in the life cycle have. But this is normal. In fact, no yeah. behavioral manifestation or actual capacity would suffice if it's truly ontological, for your view, I think. Yeah, in the back, please. Yes, you. And so I guess my question is for Dr. Davis, but I'll open up the whole panel. On their thoughts about the differences between the blastocyst and the Petri dish, which is what we're really talking about here in human embryonic stem cell research, or SCNT, versus you know, the actual moral status of a blastocyst in the womb. Because in the, in the Petri dish, you know, we talk about the inherent capacity, and that's something you spoke about, Dr. Davis, to develop. In the Petri dish, there is no inherent capacity. That, to develop into a human without the transfer into a uterus. And so do you draw moral distinctions between, between those two subjects? Well, uh, I would still say ontologically the embryonic human in the Petri dish still has an inherent capacity for self-development that the sperm per se does not. Okay, and what, what I'd like to argue is that there's, I think, an, an, a logical ambiguity here and a confusion between uh, state of dependency, okay, and being an individualized entity and not simply part of a larger whole. See, I would argue that uh, all human persons, my, my ontology of the person, would be inherently relational. And that it's just, uh, in a sense, an illusion to think that any living member of Homo sapiens is totally self sufficient. I would argue that we are inherently social beings and that all of our capacities, you know, arise in the context of social relationships, language, acquisition, emotional sensitivity, moral reasoning, and so forth, so that we are uh, only apparently autonomous individuals. Okay. So what I'm arguing against is a sort of Lockean, Enlightenment, uh, Cartesian, social contract uh, understanding of the person. Okay, thanks. Do others we want to respond? Omar and well, then again, are. relationships presuppose capacities by which those relationships are possible. You can't have a relationship with the wall. That, that's right. Yeah, the wall does not have an inherent capacity to develop in certain ways. Uh, let me try to make this argument a different way. The embryo in the petri dish is like the bird in the cage. We've put the bird in a cage, it'll never learn to fly, but it's no less a bird because we've put it in circumstances where it probably will never, never flourish. And this is connected to a point made earlier about the embryos left over after IVF are going to die anyway, so we might as well get some use out of them. And it's a compelling argument on its face, but I think is ultimately 
misleads us. Uh, and it's usually used in two different ways, uh, this kind of they're going to die or they do die. First, that lots of embryos never make it, even conceived in the womb. Um, but nature does all kinds of terrible things that we ought not to imitate. And secondly, in the case of the left, so-called leftover or spare embryos, the fact that we created these embryos, froze them, and then left them there says more about us and our betrayal of the embryos than it does about the standing of those embryos as beings. And to, then, to create them and then leave them there and then use that leaving them there as a justification for our using them uh, seems like a misguided moral argument, to say the least. Thanks, Eric. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, yes. Uh, your position on the embryo, um, uh, embryos create an invert in in vitro fertilization uh, would either have to be implanted or you would have to forbid in vitro fertilization. And I'd like to know which of those two positions is the consequence of your position. Right. My, my view on that, that's a good question. Uh, I hold for the you know, moral legitimacy of in vitro fertilization, but I'll, the in, implication of my position would be that you should implant all embryos that you create. Okay? And I also acknowledge here up front that it's, I think we have created a terrible dilemma by creating all these uh, you know, spare embryos without really thinking through sufficiently, in my opinion, you know, some of the uh, unintended consequences. So, yeah, we're in a bad place from my point of view. Okay, thanks. Right there, and then we'll move over to here. Uh, I, my question is for Eric. As a former member of the President's Council, would you recommend to the administration to shut down all uh, uh, infer infertility clinics because of the death of the embryos that are left over? Thank you. Uh, okay. First, I wasn't a member of the Council. I was a consultant. so even infinitely less lofty uh, than that. But look, the president can't simply shut down in vitro fertilization clinics. Uh, I think the country should have a renewed debate about how we do in vitro fertilization. I think we have created a tragic situation where we're creating far more embryos than we ever intend to implant. And now we have well over 400,000, which is the last estimate we have in the United States, um, embryos that are frozen without a clear destiny. Um, but there are other ways to do IVF. Um, there are far fewer in the hundreds frozen embryos in Germany, for example, which has very strict laws about how we do IVF. It is much more burdensome on women. One can understand a couple that has gone through years of trying to have a child arriving on the doorstep of the fertility doctor and say, get me a child, I don't care, whatever you have to do. And the fertility doctors who want to have the highest success rates possible and make it as little burdensome as possible for women creating lots of embryos. Uh, mm -hmm. And then... Only later will we worry about that. But you can do it in a way that implants every embryo that's produced, A. B, there's technology now still nascent for freezing oocytes as opposed to freezing embryos. If you could harvest the eggs all at once, freeze the oocytes, and then only produce embryos and then implant them, uh, that would be a more morally responsible way to do IVF. But even with IVF, even with the spare embryos, Every single embryo is produced as a potential child. Every embryo that is conceived is potentially the one. Compare that to the creation of human embryos solely for research purposes, which is what research cloning or so-called therapeutic cloning would be. Every embryo is created as destined to die. And I think that's an important moral distinction. Thanks, Eric. Please. Well, you all have made much about the fact that we were all once embryos, and I think that is correct. We all really, you know, we once were there. But if I were an embryo and I was sitting in a refrigerator waiting to be disposed of, or I had the chance to go out and live a different life that helps somebody, maybe the embryo that was in your friend's pancreas, I would be happy to do that. I, mean, I think you all are... are giving the embryos a short shrift here. They may have, <laughs> they may want to live. They may want to do this. Let's give them a chance. Right. <laughs> give life a chance. Never thought of it that way. Any uh, uh, well, uh, yeah, well, I, I, either one of us can I respond understand to what you're saying. And uh, I guess my difficulty is knowing, well, uh, how do I know what any particular embryo might choose? So what I would say that maybe the sort of a Rawlsian veil of ignorance thing, well, let's, let's give them a chance to exercise their choice. And if they want to self-sacrificially donate their body to medical research, you know, that's fine. Okay, but let's not make that choice for them. Please. <clears throat> My father was a research chemist for a good year's hire in rubber for many years. And something similar happened with the environmental movement, that the corporations always ha said, 
this isn't worth the trade-off, it's going to cost us so much, but when they assign their research chemists to, to figure out ways to do things with less harmful chemicals or whatnot, often it would cost the company less. A lot of the utilitarian argument was, was spurious. Uh, should we as a society declare a 20-year moratorium on the embryonic cell research and just let the adult stem cell research unfold and see what happens that way and make sure the scientists are working for us? Lali, Omar, or the doctors would be likely ones to answer that question. I'd, I'd be happy to uh, make a response. And I, I think that there is one shortcoming with the suggestion, and that would be that adult stem cells are capable of replacing things that we hope to learn and do with embryonic stem cells. And um, that's, that's simply not the case. I think that there are, 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 are many similarities in terms of the hopes and intent of research, but it, I think it's something that's been um, too overstated in terms of the replaceability of one for the other, especially where embryonic um, stem cell research is concerned and umbilical cord blood stem cells are often yeah. invoked. There are certainly tissues in the body that appear to have no adult stem cell. Um, the, the human pancreas, uh, certain aspects of the neural system, the heart, and while that research goes on, to say that we should limit ourselves to the adult stem cells for those tissues means we have nothing to research. And I think that, that there are some important areas where embryonic stem cell research appears to be the only answer, at least the science stands today. Can I, can I add to this briefly? I think there's been lots of overstatement on all sides of this debate. Uh, I, I certainly think opponents of embryo research have at times preached what I call the gospel of adult stem cells uh, in a ridiculously irresponsible and overstated way, as if adult stem cells are going to cure every malady known to human beings. Uh, that said, I think even more responsible has often been the advocates for embryonic stem cells and promising. And you would probably agree with this to some degree. As a responsible advocate for embryonic stem cell research, we do no favor to those suffering from terrible diseases by promising them cures far in advance of knowing whether there will be cures. Now, I think the elite scientists have to be trusted in that there is really exciting things that you can do and potentially only with embryonic stem cells. Uh, you have to take the serious people in the scientific community at face value in that. I'm not a scientist. Um, but we may have to accept that there are some things that would be wonderful to do from a scientific and medical standpoint that from a moral standpoint we ought not to do. Uh, Paul Ramsey, who's one of the sort of founding figures of modern bioethics, had a great line, which I think he may have borrowed from some previous ethicists, that the moral history of mankind is more important than its medical history. Usually those two things march forward together, and our medical progress and our moral progress work uh, in unison. But sometimes there's a tension, uh, and, and as much as we are a civilization that lives in judgment, it's the moral judgment that I think is higher than the medical judgment when those things come into tension. Thanks. We have um, diverging Christian views on the panel. We have, however, only one Jewish and one Muslim view. I would especially welcome questions representing a different Jewish or different Muslim perspective. Also, there's no Roman Catholic represented on the panel and not, no one from the non-Western religious traditions. Those are areas that I'd especially welcome from the audience as we proceed. I don't have a, I don't have a question like that, but I, I would like to bring up the soul. Uh, Lely, in her very low-key way, made a point of calling the blastocyst a pre-embryo. Pre um, I got onto this when I read Francis Crick's book, The Astonishing Hypothesis, where he and others since, I believe, have kind of identified the soul with the consciousness of self. And interestingly enough, Jerry Edelman and others at Rockefeller have shown that consciousness requires more than one cell type, perhaps five. We all know the blastocyst only has one kind of cells. So I'd like to propose and ask for comments from the panel that the blastocyst doesn't have consciousness, can't have a soul, and therefore is a pre-embryo, and that's a very good place to draw the line. Huh. Okay, thanks. Let's see if any panel member wants to respond to that. Well, well just, just very quickly, again, my, my argument has sort of been the reverse, that consciousness is not of the uh, essence of the person, but consciousness arises out of uh, personhood, okay, and that that, that blastocyst has certain in, intrinsic capacities, okay, that other types of embryos, frogs, chimpanzees, and so forth, do not have, and uh, 
will not, will not have. So I think there's uh, confusion of the categories there. Can I, can I add quickly to that? We definitely. And Omar, do you want to respond? Yeah, go ahead. Um, two quick points. First, this term pre-embryo is simply irresponsible and I think inaccurate. There's no such thing as a pre-embryo. You have gametes, which are a certain kind of entity, and then you have embryos once you have the fusion of gametes and you create an embryo. Uh, this term pre-embryo has been used irresponsibly, I think, to try to, uh, uh, again, make the case for scientific progress while uh, weakening, I think, the, the moral uh, conversation, point one. Uh, point two is... Uh, this notion of consciousness as a definition of our person, and I think fails as a kind of moral category. There are lots of human beings who we would all acknowledge as beings we want to care for, including people with late-stage dementia whom we want to cure, theoretically, using stem cells, who don't have consciousness uh, or full consciousness in this way. And so uh, we are bodily creatures, not simply spirited consciousnesses. Uh, and our bodily life, our history and time, begins at the moment that the human embryo is created. And so I don't think as a moral guide, this definition of consciousness as the notion of personhood is a very wise one. Okay, right, thanks, just, just Omar, to follow, follow Omar up. and then Lely. Yeah, I think, as Philip mentioned, uh, his account of personhood doesn't, is not amenable to any behavioral characteristics, including consciousness. So th that's why I believe he's, he says it comes, personhood becomes before consciousness. But on any kind of, um, you know, account that did take those things into account, you have to really ask not just about consciousness, but I mean, this is a debate that bioethicists and philosophers have. At what point do you trade off different things? But to do that, to enter into that debate presupposes that you are not putting infinite value into a blastocyst. Um, and yet, clearly, consciousness requires more than five cell types. Um, and that's the whole premise by which you uh, balance off different aspects that would that would account for moral status, and that is why I think nobody, um, everybody, we, we even people with dementia, we don't ask uh, much as much from them as other people for the same reason that we don't, um, I think, give them as much uh, as much rights as we would um, an old twenty, you know, twenty eight month old baby or an eight month old eight year old because. Um, yeah, I think it's a hard thing to admit, but their moral status does go down, and we treat them differently. For example, physicians don't ask men over 75 to have prostate exams. Does that mean that their moral status is down? Yes, because we know that we have a certain number of exams you do, and after a certain age, you just don't do it because you think it's a utility argument. And I think our society functions that way. Um, whether we want to recognize it or not, it's fine. But Just two, two quick comments. Uh, I, Lolly was next, and then... Uh, Sure. Or just get back to Eric that I think that um, I didn't use the word pre-embryo myself. I was quoting, but I use the word blastocyst can be in relationship, just as a dead person can be in relationship in some way. And I think that it's that whole uh, framework of how we think about it that's important in theological terms. I also think that we need to deal in our culture with suffering and death a little better than we do because if death is so absolutely to be prevented at any cost we will do anything to sustain life and that could be problematic. Jack wants to respond. Right, just real. Uh, quick. We pastors know. Yeah. A couple of quick observations on say advanced dementia case and, and that's I would say that uh, you could say that well it's it's for social flourishing it's it's best to uh, maintain strong moral sentiment with uh, persons uh, with impaired abilities at the margins of the social order for the, for the sake of the whole social order. I think it's better for our social ecology. And I'd like to also argue by analogy that other weak and vulnerable human subjects like embryos also, uh, what I'm trying to do is to push uh, our social consciousness so that we see the embryo uh, in, in a different light. I'd also raise the question, uh, if, if you, again, make consciousness the essence of the person, okay, and, and the severe uh, dementia patient, well, does that person become a candidate then for medical experiments that might benefit third parties? Or how about, you know, worst case scenario, uh, organ harvesting? So, again, it's, it's, a, it's a line drawing problem. And I'd say that there, there are problems in drawing a bright line. You know, what, how much consciousness must the person retain in order to uh, you know, not have their body violated. Mm -hmm. yeah, they do, um, actually. Since, 
since we're down, down to only five minutes, maybe I could call on three audience members to make comments. Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. And then allow the panel to respond all at once. Here's the first question yes. in the back. Uh, Was there a hand? No, I had. Yeah, I know. I just want to take three, and then we'll do those in a row. Okay, second and... All right, well, let's just give it those two. Please go ahead. Can I go? Yes. Okay. You asked for common ground. I believe, and I'm sure the panelists will correct me if I'm wrong, their common ground is they all talked about embryos. And I'm really sorry that the scientists called this debate about embryos, because it's not about embryos. It's about progenitor cells. It's about stem cells, and it's about blastocysts. This is not a slippery slope. We are talking about blastocysts. We are not talking about Auschwitz. We are not talking about harvesting human organs. We are not talking about killing people for body parts. We are talking about blastocysts. And I think that we should keep that as the argument. This is science. This is not theology. And the definition, first of all, one third of all pregnancies do not end up in human life. I'm a pediatrician and I know. The other part is, if you deliver a baby who is 20 weeks gestation, that baby is not going to live. We cannot do that at this point in time. So let's talk about blastocysts. Let's not talk about embryos. Embryos are telling everybody, oh, there's a little human being. There is not a little human being until that zygote and egg uh, is implanted into a uterus and a placenta is working. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Let's go ahead, please. What we're talking about is the potential for human life, and we also have the potential to save and help millions and millions of people. Um, and so until we fully understand when that human life, you know, becomes human as we know it, you know, and, and develops that consciousness as we as has been discussed, um, you know, that's when the answers will be uh, come forthcoming. Um, I think you know, 160 years ago, a very similar debate occurred just down the street at the Ether Dome, and it was you know science versus religion, and none of us I think can uh, uh, imagine going through any type of surgery or, or any procedure without anesthesia. Um, but it, it, this is the exact same type of debate, and it was all about taking risks. And mm. I think that's what this what this country is formed on is taking calculated risks. Um, and without that, we won't, won't develop uh, fully as human beings as we were supposed to. Thanks. Let's take one more, and um, then I'll have the panel make whatever closing comment they want to make before we end. I, I think I'd like to make the comment that, in many respects, uh, the, the argument is over. It, all over the world, there is stem cell research going on. Every culture has a different perspective. Some are very, very liberal. Some are very conservative. But that research is going on today. So I pose a question to you that let's look ahead in the future. Let's look 10, 15 years. Let us say that hypothetically that a cure for diabetes, juvenile diabetes is found in China. And that it, it meets all uh, uh, protocol and, and standards of the world. And it comes back and the treatments are now available in the United States. How do you go to your people that you have opposed this too, and they have a child, let's say, that has juvenile diabetes that's going for that cure that came through embryonic stem cell research. Let's look 10 years ahead, because that science is going on now. We unfortunately have handcuffed our scientists in this world. And one other, uh, one other comment, and that was, why don't we wait a year and give the adult stem cells? My personal position is I have a son that's paralyzed. My father suffered with juvenile diabetes for over 50 years. Last year, I lost a very good friend from MS who suffered, suffered. You're asking people to suffer one day in the life of the suffering. One day is just beyond comprehension. So when you make these decisions, you have to go back to the living, the suffering, and you can't put them into a group and say the crippled and the, the lame and the unfortunate and the disfigured and they should suffer this because God has put them on this earth and that they reach another level of holiness. These people are suffering. So I'm saying that let's look ahead to the future when the sciences are, are formed. Thanks. And what would your positions be then? Thanks. 
I think the fairest way is for us simply to move across the panels to allow them to say a, a closing word, and then we need to dismiss ourselves on time. Eric, would you begin? Uh, sure. Three quick points. First on this issue of the blastocyst. A blastocyst is a particular stage of an embryo. And in fact, the term blastocyst is really more an adjective than a noun. It's the blastocyst stage of an embryonic life. It seems to me to use the term embryo is scientifically and embryologically precisely accurate if you consult any embryological textbook. And I think it clarifies the moral question, whereas to use a term like blastocyst, in fact, I think hides the moral question to some degree behind a technical term. Second point, I think it's wrong to turn the stem cell debate into some kind of a grand debate or fight between science and religion. Everybody here is pro-science. The most vigorous advocates for some of the most cutting-edge areas of science, not only adult stem cell research, but some of these alternative methods of deriving embryonic-like stem cell research, are, are opponents of embryonic, embryo-destructive research. It's a debate about whether we should destroy human embryos and the noble cause of curing disease. It's not some re uh, having of the trial of Galileo, and I think that's just not helpful to the conversation. Thirdly, and let me try to return this in a way to the religious theme mm -hmm. that animated the conversation. Somewhere in the world, right now, a child is being conceived who will grow up for a few years, uh, the seeming embodiment of health, filling his or her parents with love, and then will be struck with some terrible, terrible, terrible disease. And it may be that it was a disease that if right now, at the very same moment when that child was conceived, if we did embryo destructive research without any limits at all, uh, we might have been able to cure. I think both sides in this debate wager their souls and live in a kind of judgment. Either you're wagering your soul that I ought to have destroyed those embryos to save that suffering child, or you're wagering a soul and accepting that some people will suffer, as we all do at some point in our lives, uh, but that we ought not to turn some lives simply into things to be used uh, to save others. What we're seeing in the stem cell debate is that to be pro-life, quote unquote, means you have to accept the concrete reality of death. And while I do think death is an evil and that we ought to try to conquer it or be open to its being conquered, I don't think we ought to try to conquer the evil of death using means that invite us to become evil ourselves. And I think that's what embryo destructive research invites us to do. Thank you, Eric. Omar. Um, well, I think the, the pleasure we feel at holding the levers of power is one thing, but um, the debate is, as far as I can see, over also for another reason. Um, it's great to have this conversation, but the rest of the world, like you said, is going ahead with this. And when it comes down to it, um, we'll just lose our competitive edge over uh, a few people who want to feel powerful. And it'll, it'll, it'll end up uh, working out on its own. Thank you, Omar. A uh, couple things. I think, number one, I think we do have a consensus that we, we like to see more therapeutic outcomes. But I think with, without sacrificing in, in purely utilitarian ways uh, human subjects properly recognized. By the way, I do consider the blastocyst uh, a human subject. Uh, short term, in terms of the uh, political and public policy debate, uh, I don't see any short term resolution of this. And I think uh, short term, probably the best sort of uh, compromise solution, and it's not a very uh, elegant one, is just to say that, well, uh, let's proceed with private funding, okay? I mean, that, that's, that's been invoked in other uh, moral debates uh, as well. Third observation in terms of uh, just historical perspective. Again, I, I argue that uh, society's recognition of human persons, you know, has developed over time. And I just want to, again, leave you with the question, are we being ethnocentric? You know, are we not being scientific enough to realize that, you know, recognize this, this is, you know, a normal human subject in that, in that state of uh, uh, development, okay? And that uh, uh, we will these things to exist. Thank you, Jack. Lily. Okay, wonderful, well-meaning, and kind, and compassionate, and terribly intelligent people are going forward with this. And I think we wish them... Well, I think many people who are involved in the scientific technology are not clear what power they have in their hands. I've heard them at the Whitehead Institute and various other places saying, this is, there's so much power here, but it's so unpredictable so often. And I think that they need to do more of the sort of philosophical probing that we've been trying to do today and to, to feel that they're more secure in the, the worth, worth of, of what they're about. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we've done the impossible. They said it was impossible to discuss religious perspectives and stem cell research in a calm and rational and respectful <laughs> manner. I think the panel has succeeded at that. Please join me in thanking them for their participation. i surprised to see you here. Of Harvard and the Stem Cell Institute at Harvard, I'd like to thank all of you for being part of the conversation and also encourage you to think of this as an ongoing conversation. Um, someone mentioned that you know, the, science, the scientific work is going on around the world. So is this very same discussion going on in all parts of the world, all the countries of Europe, uh, Middle East, the Far East. So please be part of it. Please continue the conversation. And thanks again for joining us.